Hello, we are the LGB Math Department, and today we'd like to talk to you about decolonizing the math curriculum. We'd like to recognize the influence of culture, gender, and civilizations on shaping mathematics and how we teach it. Here at LGB, maths is taught all the way from primary school up to secondary school. Maths is a compulsory subject in all schools throughout the world, at least until the age of 16, and often in programs such as the IB Diploma subsequently. If not, it is at least a popular elective for the final two years. Many university courses include some units on mathematics and or statistics. What is striking is that all the curricula taught and all those various cultural settings, what is taught is mostly the same everywhere, with only minor differences. Maths is taught at school because it is used as part of citizenship, something that we use every day, such as reading train schedules, or maybe our personal finances, or understanding how to read the results of surveys, or maybe reading newspaper articles, making sense of the statistics that they contain. Maths is also used professionally, Almost everywhere, we expect maths as part of science and technology or biotechnology and medicine, but it's even used by lawyers who base their arguments on logic and demonstration, by visual artists who use perspective and geometry to create beautiful pieces, or bus drivers who need to calculate times and calculate trajectories. It's also used by diplomats and world leaders who have to weigh the pros and cons of various choices that they make. Maths is present everywhere. It's taught in all schools and used throughout the world. It concerns everyone. So, why would we want to decolonize the maths curriculum? Well, here we want to ask ourselves a few questions. Maybe, does the curriculum taught not apply to some cultural or ethnic minorities? Or do some feel left out of the curriculum as it is? Is there really this perception that maths is centered on the achievements of dead white men? Or do we, without realizing it, convey an idea of superiority of a culture over others? In order to answer these questions, we decide to go back and start from the beginning of mathematics. All civilizations have developed a number system and some more elaborated ways, recipes of sort, to count, to measure, and to calculate. These methods were always developed to solve practical problems, such as measuring land, counting cattle, sharing profit, etc. They were adapted to fit different situations, but specific results were seldom generalized. Until the Greeks, that is. Around the 6th century BCE, the Greeks started to formalize their approach to go beyond the basic needs and to develop it without necessarily a practical use just for the sake of it, sometimes even just for fun. Generalizing and proving results quickly became a school of thought for mathematics, very similar to what happened in philosophy. This formal approach gave the basis on which math is taught in schools and universities to this day, although much content has of course been added to it since. However, it would be false to think that the Greeks developed their theories from scratch. Their hegemony came at a time when much had already been discovered. Or was it invented? This is actually a central question in theory of knowledge, and we will refer to it again later. Indeed, if the Greeks were able to formalize mathematics, it was thanks to the remarkable findings and contributions of several civilizations before them. As Newton will later declare, if they have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So much so that the history of math is now, and has been for some time, a subject of its own right. It so happens that for the Greeks, all the ingredients were there for such a revolutionary approach to STEM. A field of knowledge that had already become quite rich by then. Traders bringing this knowledge back to Greece. A well-organized democracy giving some people time to engage in activities beyond daily subsistence but also the desire to acquire and develop knowledge. So what happened before the Greeks? We have mentioned before that mathematics is intercultural, 
or even acultural, that all civilizations have developed mathematical tools to fit their needs, and that for a long time, these were developed independently and adapted according to the culture and to the linguistics. The earlier trace of a counting system has been found in, in the Lebombo Mountains, located between South Africa and Iswatini. It is made of a baboon fibular bone with incised markings, dating around 35,000 BCE. Since then, we have found evidence of counting systems in various regions of the world. To cite but a few, Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, India, North Africa, South and Central America. They presented different symbols, of course, but also different methods of grouping quantities when counting. If we are now used to counting in base 10, it was not the case in other systems. Everywhere, those systems evolved and improved, as did the need for increasingly complex operations, that is, ways of combining numbers, or in short, arithmetic. Here is an example of the progress in time of such an evolution in the counting system in India, and another one from China. The system we use today is called the Hindu Arabic numerals, the name varies slightly, because it was developed in India around the year 700 and brought to Europe via the Arabic scholars who further developed it. Indeed, the decisive step was provided by Brahmagupta in 628 by inventing a symbol for zero. Never before was the concept of nothingness denoted by a symbol. This led to the system we use now, with a place value. All numbers, no matter how large, can be written using only 10 symbols, no more. All other number systems before this either relied on more and more symbols being added to represent large numbers, or a very clumsy way of duplicating those symbols. Scholars could now engage in far more complex calculation than ever before. Try these simple calculations using Roman numerals, for example. It's far from easy. We are so used to base 10 that it's very difficult for us to count in other bases. But what other bases are there? The base 20, or bigesimal system, probably using fingers and toes, was used by the Aztecs and the Mayans, and still now in Bhutan. We still have traces of it in languages all over the world. In Yoruba, a language of West Africa, in a Maori language, but also in several European languages, including French, where 80 is 80, literally four twenties. More ancient still, the sexagesimal or base 60 system, introduced by the Sumerian in the 3rd millennium BCE and passed down to the ancient Babylonians. It is still used for measuring time, angles and geographic coordinates. We don't count to 100 minutes, but only to 60 to add an hour. So what exactly have the Greeks done then? From Thales de Millet in 600 BC and for the next three centuries, scholars such as Pythagoras, Euclid or Archimedes introduce a logical structure to mathematics, and above all, they introduce the notion of proof. Indeed, the Greeks systematically tried and often managed to generalize their result. The 345 right angle triangle was familiar to the Egyptians, for example. We know they used it to build their pyramid 2000 years before Pythagoras. However, it is Pythagoras who found many more such triplets, generalized the concept and proved its universal truth. Yes, the Greeks proved their results. Rigorous proofs are the essence of mathematics. Unlike other types of proof in the natural sciences, for example, mathematical proofs are timeless and they establish complete certainty based on a minimum number of axioms or self-evident facts. Finally, the Greeks published their ideas. Euclid wrote the elements a, th a series of 13 books in which he gathered all the knowledge available at the time, the work of many mathematicians before him, in a logically coherent manner. Incredible as it may seem, The Elements was the main textbook used for teaching geometry and number theory until the late 19th century. Since then, from 300 AD to the Renaissance, not much happened in Europe. 
The mathematics scene was really in India, the Middle East and North Africa, where the Islamic culture developed the geometry of patterns and tessellations, but also spread and developed the more powerful Indo-Arabic number system thanks to the work of Al-Khwarizmi and Al-Kindi. Although Fibonacci eventually brought this to Europe in the 12th century, it was only in the Renaissance that Europe started to take center stage again in the development of mathematics. Nowadays, mathematics is truly a global effort, with research departments spread all around the world. Hence the need for a common universal language for mathematics. Voor elk positief geheel getal x bestaat er slechts één geheel getal tussen x en x plus 2. Per qualsiasi numero intero x esiste un solo numero intero tra x e x più 2. Per любого положительного целого числа x существует только одно целое значение между x и x plus 2. A LGB, dans nos leçons, nous tirons profit aussi souvent que possible du riche contexte culturel que nous offre le développement des mathématiques. L'histoire des mathématiques y est très présente. Elle intéresse les élèves, les captive et rend le contenu plus accessible, moins effrayant si tel est parfois le cas. Il est important de noter que depuis plusieurs années déjà, les auteurs de nos manuels scolaires, les séries pour programmes internationaux en tout cas, ont fait beaucoup d'efforts dans ce sens. Exercices dans des contextes variés, des personnages, des noms, des monuments culturellement divers. Cela peut paraître peu de choses et presque forcé pour nous, mais pour les élèves qui grandissent avec cela, ça devient au contraire naturel. Nous avons parlé plus tôt de la question de théorie de connaissances sur l'invention ou les découvertes des mathématiques. Un exemple que l'on aborde en classe qui traite de mathématiques développées indépendamment dans différentes cultures est celui de ce qu'on l'appelle le plus souvent le triangle de Pascal. En effet, Blaise Pascal a fait connaître ce triangle aux propriétés très riches dans son traité du triangle arithmétique en 1654. Pourtant, ce triangle avait déjà été publié en Chine, certes à bien plus petite échelle, dès 1261, et étudié ailleurs, y compris en Europe, bien avant Pascal. D'ailleurs, il devient « triangle de Kayam en Inde et en Perse »,« triangle de Yangui au Maghreb et en Chine », Triangle de Tartaglia en Allemagne et en Italie. Ce en quoi nous croyons dans le département de mathématiques à LGB. Les mathématiques sont inter- voire aculturelles. Toutes les civilisations et cultures ont développé des mathématiques pour répondre à leurs besoins. Aucune culture, ethnicité, tradition ni genre n'est mathématiquement supérieure. Notre connaissance humaine collective grandit à chaque abstraction. Nous nous efforçons d'aider les élèves à comprendre l'approche mathématique plutôt que la formulation des problèmes seuls. Un manque de maîtrise de la langue d'un élève ne doit pas le discriminer dans une classe de mathématiques. Nous ne nous attardons pas sur qui est crédité du développement d'un principe particulier, mais nous soulignons plutôt le cheminement du développement mathématique qui y a conduit. Nous avons un système qui n'autorise ni ne discrimine aucun étudiant à un niveau particulier. Le mérite et la mobilité ascendante sont encouragés. Notre département est composé de six femmes et de sept hommes. Nous sommes tous en mesure d'enseigner jusqu'au niveau supérieur, mais il est intéressant de constater que cette année, sur les quatre professeurs de niveau supérieur, trois sont des femmes. Si dans l'histoire, les femmes ont souvent été discriminées et n'ont eu qu'un accès restreint à l'éducation, nous espérons qu'en donnant l'exemple, ces collègues inspirent de plus en plus nos étudiantes pour étudier les mathématiques au niveau fort. En effet, nous remarquons davantage de jeunes filles dans le niveau supérieur ainsi que dans les compétitions de mathématiques auxquelles nous participons.